We are so thrilled that you, um, and the report recording is in progress, as you can hear, which is great, because we're going to share this with people over the next several months. My name is Chris Schuler, and it is an honor and a pleasure uh, to be a part of this celebration. It's a 15-year anniversary celebration of an incredible organization called Global One to One. Um, I, I want to tell you a little bit about my association with this. I'm a, I'm a television producer, a documentary film producer, and uh, we work all over the world. Um, and I met Sarah, goodness, it's, it's, been, it's been a long time, Sarah, it, it's showing our age, but it, it was back when Global One to One was called Caravan to Peace. And this was back in 2010, I believe. Um, this organization has grown and grown and grown. And it's, it's really important. I know many of you are friends of the organization or have been involved in the organization uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and you know better than anybody, um, right now, today, in this world, um, this is a very, very critical, important time to have people connect and to especially to have young people connect and to have them connect across cultures, across boundaries of all kinds, across politics. And this organization allows those connections from a grassroots level that is just astounding. You're gonna hear stories today over the next two hours about those connections that have been made. And you're gonna meet people. We got people from Thailand for gonna stay. Sake. I think we have somebody from Afghanistan. We've got people all around the world. Um, and of course, all over here in the United States. Now, one of the, one of the purposes of, of today, in addition to learning all these things and, and having just a great time together, is to raise some funds uh, to make this possible for Global One to One to continue broadening its reach. Um, and we've got, if we can go a little bit further on that slide, I think the next slide or two down the way, it's going to show you how you can contribute. Uh, those are our sponsors. We appreciate you. We're going to come back to you in a little bit. Um, but it's uh, there it is. So I, I love the QR code. I am such a, a technical uh, nincompoop. But if you got a QR code reader on your phone, you can do that. Um, there's several different ways, and we'll explain that as we go along. But we would love for you to participate, um, not only in the conversation, but financially. It would be a huge, huge help. So all that being said, I've yammered quite enough. I want to introduce you to the executive director. And Sarah, I remember meeting with you. I think it was in your living room or dining room of your home here in Albuquerque when you first started. Um, and you said, I have this crazy idea. I want to connect kids around the world. Um, and it was Peace Pals. And, and it's just amazing what you've done. So if everybody, if you can do the applause little icon, that would be great. And Sarah, I'm going to let you uh, welcome folks and, and tell people what's going to be happening here. Thank you, Chris. Yes, welcome to everyone. It's so nice to see uh, people logging on from all over the world. Um, yes, Chris, you did. You met me in my living room. Uh, and that's where I started uh, Peace Pal in 2006, initially, when it was just a few students. Um, it was with a return Peace Corps volunteer, Ismail Kassam, who had just come back from serving in Togo. And we were able to connect students in Albuquerque with students at a school in a remote area in Northern uh, Togo. And that's how the whole project began. And I honestly wasn't thinking that it was gonna grow into a major organization at all. It was really intended initially to be um, simply a pen pal program that connected kids around the world um, so that they could learn about each other. Um, but as you can see on the slide, it's been not just individuals, it's been these tremendous sponsors and partners around the world who have really made it possible for us to be able to do this work. Um, and when I started it, I honestly thought it might just be a, a short-term project, but then uh, word of mouth spread, people started contacting me and the next thing we knew, we were starting to have about a thousand students, often in nine countries every year, participating in the program. And then in 2010, uh, when you and I met, Chris, um, 
that was the year that we had a project in Afghanistan. Uh, we helped to develop a school um, in Lashkarga, Helmand province, and it was a school for girls and boys. And uh, that was a real highlight of the many years that we've been doing our program. And that was the year, Chris, where you helped, uh, you were the MC with that really remarkable event called Caravan to Peace, where we did the premiere of a documentary about the founder of the program there in Afghanistan, Dr. Mohammed Khan Karoti. And he was there. He was there, it was the world premiere. And then, yeah, we also had a wonderful performance by uh, Rahim al Haj, who played Oud. Um, so, yeah, it just grew and grew and grew. And before I knew it, I realized, okay, well, this is clearly not going to be a small <laughs> volunteer project anymore. This is now a living, breathing organization with a network around the world. Um, so, as you can see, you know, really uh, from the very beginning, one of the the core of what I wanted, not only to develop intercultural understanding, um, but ultimately, I really believe that empathy is what is the force that changes everything. And that's why this one to this emphasis on one to one has been at the core of everything we do, because it's empathy that really ignites the ability to communicate, connect, collaborate, work together. Um, so then uh, there's a slide coming up here where um, I get to show you some with the uh, Congressional Office for International Leadership. Um, we have had this amazing opportunity to host in-person exchanges. Uh, you can see here visitors we've had from Tajikistan and Serbia and Ukraine. And in fact, we're about to welcome a group um, of women entrepreneurs from Tajikistan in Albuquerque on the 29th of October, just next week. You know, Sarah, I wanted to say, and I think as people who are tuning into this, um, I want you to think of a time in your life when you met someone outside of your culture, outside of your community, Ideally, someone somewhere around the world or, or someone, it could have been down the street, but they lived a different life than you've lived and you became friends with them and you got to know them. And I, I'm thinking of that for myself as you were as you were discussing the Tajikistan people, as an example, uh, I had the good fortune of, of being able to travel over there. And I am in still in such great touch with those people. Not only that, but I spend my when I'm online with the pandemic. I'm checking every other day to see how they're doing. Um, and that's the kind of connections. I want people who are tuned in here to think about a time when you've had that connection, that personal connection with someone and how much that meant to you and how much that means to you now and how much that has influenced how you make decisions in your daily life that can in fact bring the world closer together. Cause that's, that's what this is all about. Sorry, I just got worked up. No. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, in these photos, um, I'm still in close touch with most of the folks that have visited here. Um, and then, uh, of course, even prior to the pandemic, but uh, really we've expanded this virtual exchange component. And um, so these photos show um, both. So what I like is then this photo of Ethiopia shows the experience of students actually getting a handwritten pen pal letter. And I just love the way you can see that they're just absorbed by this letter and it can really be transformative. And then we've also done a number of in-person exchanges. Um, we've had a number of, through world learning, a number of youth exchanges. Um, the one was showing youth from Mexico is Jovenes in Acción. They were in Albuquerque two years ago. And actually now, we're uh, hosting a virtual version of that. We hope next year to be able to host an in-person exchange again. And then in the upper left-hand corner, you can see, um, this is a very recent photo. We're very excited to be um, starting this new project in Algeria. And this is funded by the embassy in Algeria. And we're working with veteran teachers who I think are on the line. I saw them here a little bit earlier. Um, and this is a great, there's, yes, you think saying hello to everyone. Um, 
Yeah, and we just started being in contact with each other six months ago. And now we're launching a program with dozens of high school students in Algiers, Algeria and in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, they're gonna be learning a lot about uh, critical thinking. And so the program is called You Think. Um, so we, it's just, Chris, I can't, I can't believe how it started with just, you know, a handful of students in Togo and Albuquerque writing pen pal letters. And now here we are 15 years later, uh, 18,000 students in 30 countries. That's amazing. And, and listen, we, we've got all sorts of things for you over the next couple hours. It's not just going to be Sarah and I talking, I promise. As a matter of fact, Sarah, you've got some videos uh, mm -hmm. from some of your teacher friends around the world. Is that right? Yeah. So we're going to see a really amazing um, group of teachers that uh, when I send out a call for videos to wish us happy anniversary, we ended up getting more videos than we even knew what to do with. So yeah, let's take a listen to uh, teachers and how they've uh, been impacted. Joyeux anniversaire. Happy birthday, Global One to One from Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. My name is Laura Owlett, and I am the only French teacher in our small rural town. And even though we are such a small town, Global One to One has allowed my students to have their world expanded. They've opened up their worldview through letter writing with students in Senegal in Africa. And it's always one of their favorite parts of class. They're excited to learn about a new culture and to learn new things about their pen pal, but they're always the most excited about uh, realizing the things that they have in common. And that's such a gift that you've given my students, uh, the gift to see the world as a smaller and a more friendly place. Because of your work, uh, they're really able to better understand how we're all connected. So thank you again. Joyeux anniversaire. We appreciate you. I'm Hima Mehta, a teacher from St. Mary's School, Rajkot, India. First of all, I would like to congratulate Sarah for successfully completing 15 years of Global One to One. I have been associated with Global One to One since 2014. More than 300 students from my school have participated in this program. They learn about different culture and develop global relationships. Hello, my name is James Mosioka, the co-founder and executive director at Kenya Connect. For over a decade partnership with Global One to One, Kenya Connect students have enjoyed the unprecedented power of global connection. Happy 15th year anniversary, Global One to One. Hello, my name is Saira Zuambua from Kenya Connect. As Kenya Connect, we wish you Global One to One a happy 15th anniversary. And as you celebrate, feel appreciated of the peaceful letter connection that has helped our students to increase their global understanding. Happy 15th anniversary. Hi, I'm Jeremy Jones, and I teach Spanish 1 and 2 at Sydney High School in Nebraska. My students have participated in Global One to One's Connect One to One Pen Pal program for the last four years. This program has helped my students broaden their horizons as we are in a very culturally homogenous area. Comparing and contrasting what school and life outside of school is like for students in Spain has been informative, fun, and at times surprising. My students have overcome some of, some of their ethnocentricity as they've gotten to know their pen pal more. I appreciate the opportunity that Global One to One has provided for my students to interact with other people outside their own sphere of awareness. Happy 15th anniversary, Global One to One, and congratulations on your continued success. Congratulations, Global One to One, on 15 years. My name is Holly Rivera, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at Holy Ghost Catholic School in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I have had the opportunity and privilege of working with the Peace Pal program for about 10 years. My students have connected with Kenyan students writing letters back and forth throughout the school year. It's a wonderful program that provides a venue for students to expand their worldview by sharing and learning about each other, their culture, and their values. I'm proud to be a part of this program, and my students look forward to it every year. Hongera. Tushitelek, namaste from Nepal. My name is Dorje Lama. I'm an English teacher in Sri Mangaldi Boarding School. Sri Mangaldi Boarding School is uh, located in Nepal and it is a school for Himalayan children and uh, it has been an, a great opportunity for our school to work with Global One to One and we have learned uh, many things exchanging language, culture, 
the way of life and how things can be uh, shared through uh, a platform of letters and many more. And it was a great uh, year working with Global One to One. And we would like to wish a happy 15th anniversary to the Global One to One and wish for many years to come. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Tichnow at U.S. Catholic School. It's been my real pleasure over the years to work with Sarah and Global One to One. You know, and I think the organization's role is really critical. And that's why when I found out about it, I immediately got myself and my students involved in it. And, you know, over the years, I've seen a lot of great interactions between students through these through letter exchange and some real growth in, in their understanding of different cultures and cross-cultural understanding in general. And as a plus, we've even been able to do a few service projects with the partner school. So all in all, it's been a great experience. I really appreciate all the work people put into this. Congrats on 15 years. Hi, I'm Lucy Kazakowski, English teacher at Sandia Prep. And I wanted to congratulate Global One to One for their awesome work uh, in connecting students uh, through letter writing and cultural education, fundraising, and uh, raising awareness of our global experience. So thank you so much for your fantastic work, and we wish you 15 more great years. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kamal from Morocco. Uh, I want to wish a Global One to One happy anniversary, and I hope that the coming years will bring a lot of success and more achievements to this foundation. I'd like to thank Sarah for the opportunity to um, work with American high school, American teachers. Uh, my students and I have enjoyed a lot of good moments and have enriched our experiences in different way. Thank you and keep in touch. of Search to Harvard Place from Kampra, Uganda. I am a global one-to-one -one project coordinator in Kawempe, Rugoba area in Wachiso district. I wish global one-to-one -one organization a happy and successful 15th anniversary. May the Lord God bless you all for your contribution towards the existence and successful operation of this organization. Long live Salah, long live global one-to-one -one community members. Peace, love, and joy. Wow, from all over the world. That's got to make you feel pretty pretty good. It really does. It brings a tear. Listen, yeah. part of my job today, we, we, we've got some amazing conversations that are going to take place over the next two hours. We've got panel discussions on our number of global issues, which is going to be really cool. And I'm going to let you introduce uh, Dr. Jenkins here shortly. But also part of the goal of this is to raise some funds. And that's how you do it. Right now on the screen, uh, you just get, get your get your cell phone out. This is so cool. And you put in the QR code. Boom. It comes in. You can connect. And, and as we say, if, if we all do a little bit, it, it turns into a big bunch. We had um, and I'm very thrilled. We've got some people who have already donated. Uh, and we're going to go through some of those in, in just a little bit. But for now, I, I want to make sure we stay on time. So I'm going to let you, Sarah, introduce Dr. Jenkins. And I, I am assuming he made his way in. He's so busy. He's like, when, when we had our meetings, he was like driving in. So hopefully right. he's here and you can introduce him. Yeah. Denise and Haley, is Dr. Jenkins with us? Yes, he is. Excellent. Well, I am very honored to be able to introduce uh, a really remarkable man and mentor uh, of so many people, uh, Dr. Bowtie Jenkins. Um, and uh, Dr. Jenkins is a very inspiring speaker and leader, um, helping workplaces and individuals uh, develop greater understanding, intercultural understanding, diversity appreciation, and inclusivity. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, I'll let you uh, tell a little bit more about yourself. Uh, we're going to be able to hear from you about your thoughts about intercultural understanding. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Sarah. Oh, it's such an exciting time to be here, my friends. Happy 15 years. I mean, I wish I had my birthday cake. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and I'm just really excited to be here. And what better moment in time to just really look at where we're at today. And this is a moment of hope. This is a moment of peace. This is a moment of cultural understanding because you decided to show up today and to be in this space around cultural empathy and cultural compassion. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Todd Jenkins. I'm known as Dr. Bowtie Todd. Um, and yes, I love bow ties, as you can see my <laughs> necktie on today. And I have to tell you a very quick story before we get started with today's conversation around my necktie. So I, I love bow ties. And when I uh, travel, I love to travel locally and globally. People, individuals will stop and ask me about my necktie. They ask me questions, you know, where did I get it from? Did I tie it myself? And yes, I, I do tie my own ties. Uh, and yes, I have a lot of ties. I have over 300 neckties. So I, 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 I wear quite a, a selection, if you will. But I had this epiphany one day that, you know, what if we lived in a world where people would genuinely stop what they're doing to be curious about another human being as they are about my necktie. What if we lived in that world that we led our curiosity with compassion and we also imagine and really committed to the thought of that every human has value. And my friends today, that is the discussion. That is why we're here because global one-to-one -one allow for that human connection to be possible. It is vital for organizations like this to be able to spread its wings and scale to allow for humanity to become into your hands. I have my globe in my office. You know, you can't really see it, but this is the globe. And what this allow for us to do together is allow for you to have the globe in your hands by simple of a pen, by simple of a heart and a mind to connect with another human that you never met before, just like people are connecting with my bow tie. And honestly, what we've seen in my, what we call the bow tie conversation is I created an acronym because what we see in research and practice is people are very challenged on how to have conversations with other humans that they never met before. So I'm going to share with you all a quick acronym of bow tie of how, yeah, I love your globes. I love it. I love your globes. I see some globes on the Zoom right now. But I'm going to share with you all the bow tie philosophy. And this is going to be some expectations of how we have the conversation and connect throughout the rest of our time today, together. So let's get started. The first letter of bow tie is the letter B, OK? This stands for in any conversation, I ask that you be mentally present, OK? I know that we're all virtually connected physically in our own spaces all across the world, but I ask that you be mentally present during, during our time today. The next letter of bow tie is the letter O. O stands for have an open heart and an open mind. We're gonna hear from varieties of perspectives all around the world and it's so beautiful, why? Because every human has value, but I ask that everyone has an open mind and an open heart. The next letter of bow tie is the letter W. W stands for willing to share your own perspective and own your truth. I think everyone on this call has a unique story, my friends, and it's up to you to share it. So it's going to be times throughout the conversations. You can put questions in the chat box. You can put captions on Facebook. We ask that you share this message, reshare the link, because everyone has a story to share. Now, I'm not sure if we have any bow tie wearers on the call today, but Usually people tell me the most difficult part of the bow tie is this knot in the middle. And we see that this is the most difficult part of really cultural understanding. How do you tie it together? How do you leave an experience better than you came in? And my friends, that's the bow tie philosophy. So let's have fun together. Let's be present. Let's be engaged. Let's be curious. But most importantly, let's walk away and lead this experience better than we found it. And also, let's support the organization that is doing this great work. So if that makes sense to you, in the chat box, will you write the word bow tie? If you're going to agree to the bow tie philosophy, 
in the chat box, in the captions. Let's see. Oh, I see some bow ties coming in, Sarah. Yes, yes, yes. So now, since I see bow ties, we can now get started. I love it. So we're here today talking about intercultural exchanges, intercultural communication. I get the pleasure of working in corporate America every day as a diversity, equity, and inclusion leader. I also have a firm that we do this work all across the world, that we work with small and large organizations. Why is this important? This is important because intercultural competencies, intercultural alignment is crucial and central to the workplace today. The workplace is global, my friends. Our, our, our neighborhoods are global, right? Uh, you know, we, we are a land of immigrants, right? Uh, and we are being able to bring our cultures and our traditions and now, especially in the workplace, as we say around inclusivity, is bring your whole self, bring your authentic self to work. And why does that matter to us today and what we're doing with the mission of Global One to One? Global One to One allow for the skill set of being able to connect with other individuals who are different than you be in practice. Because of the intercultural competencies that is built through the relationships that we're you know, that we strive for and facilitate every day with humanity just by simple of a stroke of a pen, right? Think about the heart and the emotion and the cultural understanding that goes into that exchange. This is very vital to the workplace today because today and tomorrow is global. The marketplace is global. global. And so your intercultural alignment allow for you to do that. And so I'm just so happy to be a part of this conversation. And as we see in diversity, equity, and inclusion, this is essential. And another thing I would say, last but not least, that I love about this organization and what we're doing is that this allow for an equitable approach. It allows for an equitable approach. What do you mean, Dr. Jenkins? Well, it is a difference between equality and equity. And the best way to explain the difference, I'm gonna share with y'all my shoe. <laughs> this is my shoe. No disrespect. You know, I wear a size 10 and a half brown shoe. This is my favorite shoe to wear. And I, I love this shoe. When it comes to equality, equality is that Sarah get a shoe, Greg get a shoe, Hector, it's like Oprah, everybody gets shoes, okay? That's equality. But equity is giving everyone that's listening a shoe that fits them. You have to think about that. That means I have to actually come get to know you, come get to know your story, and also think about your access to opportunities. And equity allow for us to remove those barriers so you can expand the opportunity. And that is what Global One to One does today. They allow for intercultural opportunities and experience to go into everyone's home, does not matter your background or what your access is. And that's why I love this. And that's why I'm here today because I'm a champion. I am someone, I had a great pleasure to go around the world and travel. I came from poverty. I came from a low income uh, community here in the South of the United States. And I will tell you, you know, I found my first experience through books. That's how I traveled the world by reading books. And then I was fortunate to have an experience to get on a plane and go to Sao Paulo, Brazil and live there for my first exchange. Now, since then, <laughs> I have never stopped traveling, even whether it's to the library, to the museum, to another country, or just another tradition that I've never explored in my own community. So I want people to understand that you can bring the globe into your own hands, and that's what we're talking about today. So as we get uh, started with today's conversation, I'm going to be one of the moderators. And we're going to have a great lineup. It's a wonderful lineup of so many different individuals coming together to really share their space. And so let's go ahead and get, can we go ahead and get started, Sarah, with the, with the lineup today? 
Wonderful. All right. Well, let's get started. So what we, what, how this is going to be facilitated, my friends, is that we have so many great perspectives and we want to hear their stories. We're going to introduce them and have them come on board, tell a little bit about themselves and really just give their perspective. Okay. So I'm going to get, I'm not going to keep talking. So I want them to come and share. So let's get started with our first question and our first roundup. And I think we're going to uh, really talk about uh, international exchanges, right? And, uh, and really why this is important. Um, and so what I really want to have is hear someone else's perspective of, you know, what is the intercultural exchange? We keep hearing this word today, intercultural, intercultural, but what does that look like? What does that feel like? And what is that like in practice? So what I would love to do is have Salma and Robin come up and share their perspective. And I'm going to turn it over to you all to introduce yourselves and, and address those questions. Robin? Hello, everyone. Global one to one. First of all, congratulations on on this awesome milestone. Um, I, I, I'm proud to be associated with uh, this group and this team. I'm I'm a board member too, uh, but yeah, I, I do have some interesting perspectives on this topic on on intercultural communication and empathy and uh, cultural differences. Um, um, who's uh, who's putting the slide up on on the screen? Awesome. So Salman, uh, you wanna go ahead? Hello everyone and happy birthday, uh, Global One to One. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here because I was part of Global One to One and being you know, this kind of citizen exchange uh, it was, was really interesting for me. And now intercultural exchange is something that I deal with every single day in my job. Uh, so I, I'm very happy to talk about that and talk about really the importance of intercultural exchange and the work that Global One to One is doing. Uh, first, I see some familiar faces in the audience, uh, some familiar names. So shout out to my friends in Algeria, Khaira Mazuri and Mustafa Luznaji. Uh, and I'll be referring to them later on in my presentation. And then Ricky Quintana back in New Mexico, also doing great work over there. Uh, so, so really happy to see those, those names. So when I was in high school, uh, we had a, 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 an exchange, kind of a, a pen pal exchange. Uh, it was called Project Peace Pal with Global One to One. And our Islamic Center in New Mexico was involved in kind of uh, starting this exchange with uh, some students in Togo. And that's how I got to know Sarah and the great work that Global One to One was really doing in all of these different countries. Um, and since then, I that was my first kind of uh, formal exchange uh, introduction to this kind of intercultural exchange and, and the, the bridges that can be made even when you're a high school student. Uh, further on, I wanted to, to do this more intensively and I was able to get a scholarship to go to Egypt as an exchange student, study Arabic with the State Department and this was just in high school and it was my first experience abroad as a student. Uh, it was really incredible to be with the host family and learn just how important it is to have that kind of citizen diplomat experience. You don't represent um, you know, a specific company or a specific government, but you are a representative of your country. Um, some of the Egyptians I met had never met an American before. You know, It's not like we were going um, and touring the pyramids and than going home. We were actually living in these neighborhoods, being part of a, of a community uh, that uh, this community might not otherwise have the experience of hosting Americans. So you were really on the spotlight. Uh, you had to make a good impression about the United States and American culture and teach others English, learn their language. And I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, when we were in Egypt, we also were able to go to the US embassy there in Cairo and I just remember how fascinated I was seeing this little microcosm, this little city within Cairo, where everything looked like, you know, Arlington, Virginia, where you have a post office and a little grocery store with American stuff. I thought it was surreal and interesting and fascinating. And speaking to the diplomats and learning about how they uh, live their day to day was very interesting, but also 
it made me realize this is exactly what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I wanted to promote intercultural exchange from the embassy, from living in that in, in other communities and, and talking to international students and adults about the value of getting to know another culture, traveling or doing programs virtually. And, and that's really the, the amazing part of, of, of leaders like organizations like Global One to One that have this link between the United States and other countries and their people. So I think you can never underestimate the, the value of intercultural education for Americans, uh, both in their own careers or as a country generally, but also for US foreign policy. I mean, we have embassies in almost every country around the world. We value these relationships with other countries and these other countries all want to, to have their students studying in the United States. They want to sometimes host Americans in their own countries. They want their people to learn English uh, and they want uh, a viable workforce that can uh, form connections with American businesses or American universities um, and Americans more broadly. Um, and intercultural exchange is a necessary part of that uh, experience. Um, if Americans do not know what the world is like, it's going to be very difficult for our generation or the next generation to form these linkages between other countries and, and, and just promote um, what, what they want to do with their careers. So this is really the importance of public diplomacy. It's to, to build these bridges between people and the US government um, really relies on organizations like Global One to One to do these, uh, to do these great programs like you think the You Think project is uh, just got started in Algeria, where I was on my previous tour, uh, and it was really fascinating to see this kind of project come together. Uh, we have two fascinating program leaders back in Algeria, Khaira and Mustafa, um, that are going to to work with Sarah and Global One to One and promote critical thinking skills, which are extremely important in in our world today, and making connections especially during the pandemic when travel between Algeria and the United States was completely stopped. Um, and so this kind of hybrid virtual and in-person project is something that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, to close up, if any of you would, would like to get involved with what the US uh, government and US State Department are doing in terms of intercultural exchange, um, you should always check uh, state.gov or each uh, individual embassy uh, that is closest to you if you're tuning in from abroad. Um, we have exchange programs for almost anyone um, of not just American citizenship, but also others. Um, and to, to, to get involved also with the You Think project uh, and, and Global One to One's other projects out there that are in conjunction with other embassies uh, out there. So, Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to Robin's presentation. Go ahead, Robin. Awesome, thank you, Fema. Can you uh, hit the slide screen? So in, in, in business, um, we often use uh, the statement, the world is flat. And I, I wanna make that very, very real for, for audiences. Um, so I'm part of a small startup company called customerinsights.ai. It's um, based in Arizona, USA. Um, it's, it's not uh, a government run company. It, it's not a part of the embassy. It, it's not a Fortune 500. Uh, sorry, it's not a Fortune 500 company where uh, you have um, companies like Apple or Microsoft or Google, where um, th this is expected. You have entities all across the globe. It's, it's simply a small startup based out of Arizona. But um, if, if, you see my, if you see the screen, uh, uh, just from a small team of 50, 60 employees, we have people coming from nine different countries, all working together. And today they are actually working out of six different locations across the globe, right? They, they are very different, um, all working in different locations and time zones. Um, their um, cultural backgrounds are different. They talk different things. Um, their beliefs in what, what you say is um, what's right for them, religion, 
um, what's um, definition of uh, black or white, um, their educational backgrounds, very different, their living standards, some are in city, some are in, in backward towns, all, all coming together, very different, but all coming um, or bounded together with this one mission of doing this business for this, this company. Uh, it, it's amazing how um, we, we think that this only happens with large companies or government-led um, entities, but it's happening at a very small scale too. And um, at least at, at the business level, there are a lot of support structures in schools, even in employment, where to be successful in this environment, you have a lot of support structures there. But not a lot of that is available in, in schools and, and you know, um, young environments. And, and that is exactly what Global One to One is trying to do. They are trying to become this medium to speak that, that common language. How can different people with different backgrounds, cultures, time zones, beliefs at a very young age come together to, to form a, a, a unique opinion about each other, understand each other, so we can to, uh, become better uh, in, in what we do every day. Uh, so I've, I've, I've been lucky to have um, experienced this um, all through my life. Um, growing up and, and now obviously at my work at, at Customer Insights. And I'm, I'm so proud to be associated with Global One to One where uh, we are taking this mission and vision and um, um, all, all the tools uh, to, to enable this at a, a massive global scale. And I wish Sarah and the team the, the, the very best in, in this endeavor. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robin and Salman, for sharing your story and perspective. As you all see and you learn today, is that it does not matter whether you're working for a Fortune 500 company, you could be a startup, you can, you can take your experience to the government um, and do great things. And that's exactly what the intercultural alignment allow you to do. It allowed for you to put you in places that you never thought before, um, just as we have learned from our stories shared today. So thank you again so much for sharing your perspective. And we're gonna keep the conversation going. Sarah, I turn it back over to you to introduce the next segment. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins um, and Salman and Robin. Um, the next uh, segment of uh, films that we're gonna watch, videos that we're gonna watch are from our funders and our partners around the world. Um, again, I'm just gonna let everyone speak for themselves. And if you have questions, throw them into the chat. I'll be happy to answer. Greetings from Capitol Hill. My name is Jane Sargis and I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Office for International Leadership, previously known as the Open World Leadership Center. I'm here to congratulate Global One to One and wish you all a happy 15th anniversary. Global One to One has been a trusted partner of the Open World Program for many years. In 2018, your organization hosted our Serbian delegation on an English access program in 2019, Ukrainian legislators traveled to your community on the theme of education issues. And in 2020, you were planning to host a group of delegates from Tajikistan focused on women in entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, it was postponed, as you well know, due to the COVID-19 global pandemic. Luckily, you will see this group soon as they're arriving in your community in just a few weeks. Thank you for being a trusted partner all these years. We are excited to continue working with you in the future. On behalf of all of us at the Congressional Office for International Leadership, we hope you all stay safe and healthy. Again, from all of us here, we wish to say congratulations on 15 years of impactful work. Hi, I'm Liz Schreyer, President and CEO of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. I want to congratulate Global One to One on your 15th anniversary. You've been an amazing partner with us, 
in New Mexico. And here's to 15 more years of connecting students to the world. Congratulations. Hello, Maria from Serbia. So who is celebrating the 15th birthday? Intentionally who, as Global 101, stands for extraordinary people who have been planting the seeds of peace, friendships, and connections worldwide, especially among children, students, whether it's within the Access Program or the Peace Poly Exchange or regular schools. May you continue spreading the spirit of the seed all over the globe for a long, long time. Happy birthday. Hello, Global One to One. A very warm congratulations on your 15 year anniversary from all of us at World Learning. You have all been a trusted partner of ours since 2018, hosting travel programs with young leaders from Argentina, Chile, Iraq, India, and Mexico. I personally got to know the special touch that Global One to One has on its programs when we worked together during the hybrid Communities Connecting Heritage Program, where you and your partner in India implemented a very special project called Voices from the Margins. Even before COVID, when virtual exchange became the norm, the work you did to inspire and facilitate virtual exchange between classrooms worldwide really stood out to me. And I'm so glad that our work with you on virtual exchanges continues to thrive even as we speak with the Jovenes and Acción group from Mexico. World Learning looks forward to continued work and collaboration with all of you at Global One to One. And once again, congratulations on 15 years and here's to many, many more. Hello, my name is Liliana Szczekic and I wish happy anniversary to Global One to One. I was in Albuquerque in 2019 on an open world exchange program. It was an amazing experience and I cherish every moment of it. Special thanks goes to Sarah Wilkinson who went out of her way to make us feel welcome and to organize our stay. And I envy you guys coming to Albuquerque and meeting Sarah for the first time. So enjoy every step of the way. Here we are today with your Global Ties ABQ team. My name is Julia Morales. I'm the executive director of this wonderful organization. And my left I have... Silla Abjo, and I'm the program manager. And in my right... Hector Arce, and I'm the marketing and communication manager. And we're so excited to continue working and collaborating with this amazing organization. And for this reason, we would like to wish you a happy birthday. My name is Biljana Dodic and I'm an English teacher and librarian from Serbia. Exploring the United States and learning about its culture and educational system with Global One to One has been one of the greatest experiences in my life and it has allowed me to make better and more meaningful connections between the United States and my local community. Thank you, Sarah Wilkinson and Global One to One. Happy 15th anniversary. Continue making the world a better place and a more connected one. I'm Mustafa from Algeria. I have been working in the field of education for four decades. Now I am an educational consultant and a freelancer. I have worked with IEARN International Education and Resource Work Network, where we engage both teachers and students from the Middle East, North Africa and the US on global project. Now I am engaged as a program manager for the YouThink project a project that is funded by the U.S. Embassy and is connecting students from Algeria and the USA, precisely from New Mexico. This program is working with, part with partners from Global One to One. Global One to One are celebrating 
the 15th anniversary on October 23rd. And I wish them more achievement and the best of luck. Greetings from Serbia. I was in New Mexico with the Open World Program in 2018, hosted by Global One to One. Dear Sarah, dear friends, thank you for showing me how beautiful your country is. And thank you for the smile I will always have when I think of New Mexico. I hope to see you again soon in Albuquerque or in Belgrade. It's your turn now. Happy 15th anniversary. Wow, those <laughs> connections. You know everyone. You know everyone all over the world. You know, I want, I want to go back to something that Dr. Jenkins said. Um, first of all, Dr. Jenkins, I'm a 10 and a half shoe as well. And I like those. So let's let's share some shoes here. Um, <laughs> no, and, and I don't know if you can see it. I brought in my globe too. And I, what a great thing. I, I've got one in my office. I've got one, you know, in the other office, just to remind me of the interconnectedness of all of us and how important that is. I, I must confess, uh, and, and I'm just going to take a, a second to mention this. Um, the last year has been tough on a lot of people. And, and the last, well, year and a half, really, right? And, and it really was starting to depress me. Uh, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is just horrific. First you got COVID and then you got these wars and you got the politics and you got the right and the left. And the what gives me hope, first of all, this gives me hope. Second of all, young people connected in ways that bring them together around the world is the only way we're going to survive. I mean, I am firmly convinced of that. And, and I love what you said about this is a hopeful day because it is, it is a really, really wonderful, wonderful, hopeful day. When you hear, you hear countries, I, these are names, right? Togo, Brazil, somebody mentioned, Tajikistan, Egypt, Taiwan, Algeria, Indonesia, Hong Kong, people were putting those in there. These are, these are things on this globe, they're not. They're you and they're me and they're these connections. And Sarah and this Global One to One has allowed this connection to take place on a person to person. I love the title One to One because that's what it's all about. And, and I wanna say too, a part of my job here, and I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm distracted, Sarah. I got so worked up. Um, I wanna thank some people who have already given and some people who are giving today, which is really spectacular. The Kasam family, $1,500. Claire Wilkinson, $1,500. I think you know that name, Sean. Uh, Greg Polk and Rebecca Black, $1,000. Global Ties Albuquerque, a community partner. What, what a great community partner, $500. Home Instead Senior Care, Mary Martinez, $500. Listen, take a moment. And, and I always, I tell my friends, listen, get out the crowbar, get out the wallet, put the crowbar in, jack that thing open, and let's, let's, let's make a donation. This is something that truly can change the world and gives us all hope in a way that, that really, bar none, is, is one of the best things that you can do. I, I firmly believe that. Um, and these connections will last a lifetime. And these connections are seeds, as one of your teachers mentioned. They are seeds that will grow. I think back, and I, I asked you to put in the chat some of the places that you've been. I think back to, uh, I've been to Indonesia on three separate occasions for three different projects. And I just actually, yesterday, uh, I was posting something on Facebook and, and my friend Weldy, who, who lives in Indonesia, uh, was on and he said, Chris, it's so good to hear from you. We have this connection. We talk once every oh, month or so. He's a film producer too. And, and this connection will last a lifetime. And this, I think, will change this, this overall perspective that we need to have, that we're all part of one thing. And that affects everything. That affects the pandemic. That affects global warming. That affects absolutely everything if we know we are connected around the world. Sorry, Sarah, I get all worked up about this stuff. And I think your, your videos are just fabulous. Those, those people are wonderful and spectacular. And I know your heart swells when you see those people, don't you? Yeah, and as you said, I mean, it's these are friendships. I mean, I some of these teachers and uh, partners I've known for so many years and, um, 
we have one to one relationships. I mean, it's not just, as you say, not just a, a place on the map. Um, you know, Uganda, when I think of Uganda, I think of Sikito, I think of Beatrice, I think of, you know, my friends there, people who I have never met in person, but we're connected um, because we have reached out to each other. And that was the whole point um, for, you know, I started this when my son was in elementary school because I, we were looking at the globe and we were looking at the map and I could see that the kids were kind of in a very abstract way, realizing that it was a different place, but that was it. And so having had the opportunity to travel myself, I thought, how can I, for kids that are too young to travel or people who can't afford to travel, how can I bring the world to them? And so that's how the whole program began, was finding a way. Let me ask you a question. Um, is this program only for kids? I know it started out with the pen pal, peace pal thing. Is it only for kids? Not at all. In fact, uh, the majority of uh, participants these days are high school and university students. And then these uh, Congressional Office of International Leadership delegations are young professionals. Um, so anybody can it, get involved. Anyone can get involved. There are diff many different ways to get involved. And how do they communicate now? I know you had the letter writing, which is still, I think, spectacular. Yeah. Just uh, handwritten. But, but now with the online communication, is there a lot more of that? How does that work? Well, it, we, we tailor it to each situation. So for example, with the uh, group that we currently have from Mexico, we're hosting a virtual exchange for Jovenes en Acción. Um, that's mostly video and uh, Zoom calls. And then the You Think program in Algeria is on an online platform and that's going to take place from October through April. And so that's more um, every week there are activities which can be written assignments. They'll be exchanging handwritten letters that have been scanned and then some short videos. So we really do try to be very versatile, Chris, and you know, tailor it. Which, which countries are you working on right now? Mexico, Algeria, Kenya, India, and then Tajikistan starting next week. That is, I'm so excited to meet the, is it Tajikistanis? I think it is. Um, and that, that is, that's gonna, that's gonna be Tajikis, there we go. Uh, that's gonna be pretty spectacular. Um, yeah. One other quick question, and then I know we wanna move on and, and Dr. Jenkins, I am so excited you're on here, my friend. What, what a great energy you bring to everything. <laughs> um, listen, what does it cost to participate? If people want to participate, is there a cost or a fee? Well, because we tailor the program to each individual school or group, it really varies a lot, Chris. For example, the, the program in Algeria is being funded by the embassy in Algiers. So the participants this year in that program are not paying anything because it's paid for by the embassy. Um, in the past, during the letter writing program, a student in a classroom, we would have classroom match to classroom and students would pay about $15 per student per year. Um, but it really varies a lot depending on the way the program is being implemented. Sure, got it. Well, one last thing before we get to our next conversation. And by the way, I know I've talked about this. These, these conversations that uh, Dr. Jenkins is running, there's some really neat things coming up in the next, in the next hour here uh, about intercultural exchange and digital uh, realms and keeping it personal and all these, we've got some incredible speakers coming up that you're gonna really enjoy. But, but going back just for a second, if we can pull up that slide on the, uh, the uh, how, how to get the crowbar out and get your uh, wallet involved, uh, we really would love for you to go ahead, get out the QR code. And even if it's, you know, even if it's, you can, you can do an ongoing yearly thing, you can do a monthly thing, um, what, whatever it is will be really helpful. And it's really vital to, to pledge and, and get involved and, and then get more involved. We got Ishmael's back there doing some great stuff. Ishmael Ben says, hello. Um, we got, we got things happening at Global One to One. So Sarah, I will let you introduce uh, Dr. Jenkins for the next sequence. Well, he's a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. No, it's okay. I, I think it's just so great to see all the great 
work that you all are doing. And so for anyone who's just joining us today uh, live on Facebook or just coming into the discussion, uh, we are having this a great conversation celebrating 15 years of service of Global One to One, an organization that allowing peace to manifest just by simple one-to-one -one connection through intercultural alignment and exchanges. Next up for our conversation, and this is a great segue, we have been in the midst of a strong pandemic, my friends, and my heart goes out to anyone that's listening, your family who has been impacted in a way that your loved ones was not able to stay with us today. Um, and, and we understand that in the midst of this pandemic, we have learned to be, you know, a, a very flexible and adaptive and, and really some things uh, really waking up with uncertainty, right? Um, and, and I think uh, when we come to intercultural exchanges uh, with our digital platforms, it allows for us to continue to pivot, right? A lot of programs pivot this year uh, with our interaction whether it's a written letter or you know connecting through Zoom like we are today or on Facebook, we still have the opportunity to connect and make our exchanges powerful. And so next up, we would love to have two individuals come and talk to you about how to continue to connect and really how you can be authentic and be your best self in the midst of these virtual platforms and also how to um, exceed at your experience. So without further ado, I'm gonna get out your way and have Paul and Jennifer come up and share their story. I will turn it over to you all. Hey guys. Um, so I think I'm, uh, I'm supposed to be speaking first. So I just um, in the Zoom chat uh, shared a little bit of information about me, but essentially I'm a sociologist and the founder and director of Learning Life, which is a Washington DC based nonprofit that's um, looking to essentially innovate education and citizen engagement outside school walls. Um, we lead, I lead three different programs, uh, uh, the Family Diplomacy Initiative and International Mentoring Program and Democracy Dinners. I'm gonna be telling you more about uh, the Family Diplomacy Initiative. And uh, uh, in answer to these um, particular questions, uh, that we've been asked to kind of um, uh, answer. And these are, how do we cultivate sustainable, authentic personal relationships virtually? Um, and how do we build meaningful intercultural learning communities? Um, I wanna add another question to that, which is how do we make virtual exchange matter? Or how do we, in fact, how do we make in-person exchanges matter in the long term? So that it's not just food flags and festivals, or dialogue that needs that need, leads nowhere, but actually um, is in some sense um, connected to social change and power. So um, I'm a political sociologist, um, which means I tend to focus on social dynamics and the distribution of power. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, kind of some of the challenges that we face. Uh, I think um, in developing kind of international exchange, uh, whether in person or online. Um, the first is obviously we've got some big problems, right, uh, that are international in scope. One of them is climate change. That's probably the most obvious. But there are also refugee crises. There's war, uh, terrorism, piracy, tax evasion. There are a whole slew, and of course the pandemic, there are a whole slew of issues um, that need uh, international collaboration in order for us to effectively tackle these, these issues. But there's another problem alongside this, which is exclusion from power. Um, and here, it's not just the digital divide, but a concept you might not have heard of before um, called homophily. Uh, homophily is essentially that birds of a feather flock together. Opposites do not generally attract. In social life, we tend to um, uh, uh, be attracted to people who are like us. The problem and the consequence of that is that generally uh, speaking, the people who tend to be more oriented towards international affairs and engaging in these international exchanges are people with more education, who've had parents who've traveled, et cetera, and so forth. And so how do we get people who have never traveled before um, uh, to meaningfully connect with the wider world um, and um, uh, get outside of our kind of social bubbles um, 
uh, that are defined by class, race, religion, et cetera, and so forth. And the last kind of challenge that we have is corruption. Um, when it comes to power, uh, elites uh, across the world are kind of hoarding and stealing power and resources, and that's something we have to confront. Um, so given these challenges, right, uh, big problems of um, international problems like climate change and pandemic, terrorism, piracy, exclusion from power, corruption, et cetera, how do we deal um, with those? Well, there's some good news. The first is rising educational levels across the world. Um, and that's, uh, to me, actually something that, that we don't uh, recognize enough. But what, with, what comes, generally speaking, with rising educational levels is more interest in international affairs, more curiosity about the wider world, more skill in uh, being able to communicate and collaborate, and then more tolerance for difference. So those are some three specific things that are tangible benefits of rising educational levels that have implications for our ability to do our work of international exchange. Um, second, as you're probably well aware, internet access is getting cheaper and it's expanding across the world. And third, a lot of people actually want to connect with other people across the world. Um, so much so in some cases that people, I, in fact, we're, we're going to be having a conversation about this in our own group. Um, some people, young people commit suicide if they don't have access to their phones. Um, so this is uh, both kind of a, 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 an opportunity and a problem. The challenge is how do we get people, and these are a set of challenges that are more specific to us, right? Those people are involved in international exchange, whether in person or online. And one of them is how do we get people to pay attention to the stuff that really matters? So getting people away from you know, the, the hugely time consuming games that people play, the social media, the endless TikTok videos, um, and not to mention the disinformation rabbit holes. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is collaboration. How do we get people to actually not just listen to each other across borders, but actually do stuff together? Um, and then third, uh, there's this problem of evanescence, as I call it, which is, um, which is essentially that a lot of programs are for a few weeks, a few months, um, but then that's it. And, and there's no kind of continuity um, uh, in, in building relationships over years rather than, um, than over a, a few months or a few weeks. And lastly, is this to go back to it, is this problem of, or this challenge of insignificance. How do we make our international exchanges matter um, to more than just building resumes, but actually building communities and collaborations that tackle these big problems that we have in the world. So the last thing I'm going to tell you is, is that there are some solutions, and I think they're solutions that Global One to One is doing, we're doing, and others, are, and others across the world are doing. And a lot of it is it can be done virtually. And that's the beauty of kind of, to me, virtual exchange is that you don't have to be rich you don't have to have um, uh, uh, you don't have to have a lot of money to be able to afford the plane, the hotel costs, the food, et cetera, and so forth, to have meaningful engagement with other people across the world. But it takes for us to be able to tackle these big issues, right? To to exercise, to give people power, the power they need to be able to um, collectively tackle these big issues that we're facing. We have to create online communities that last. So we personally use Facebook. We use a Facebook group that connects a large number of people, and we're actually, you know, downloading information about uh, um, uh, about the people that we have in case Facebook implodes, in case some for some reason Facebook gets pissed off at us. We we have more than just the information uh, that that's on Facebook. We get we get people's emails, addresses, et cetera, and so forth and so forth, so that we can maintain communication in a variety of ways with people online over time. Uh, and people will come and go in their levels of engagement where we want to maintain contact. So it's trying to kind of sustain uh, contact over time. Second thing is training that lasts more than a few weeks or a few months. So the idea is to give people a pathway towards development that lasts over years um, in terms of their building skills, uh, their knowledge and their connections. And lastly is connections to power. So how do we get people to um, not just simply dialogue, but actually have that dialogue matter, connect it to nonprofits, businesses, and governments, and, and make sure that, that that dialogue is actually informing policy. And so that's, I think, where the kinds of challenges that we need to be trying to address 
when we're trying to do really meaningful, impactful international exchange. So I'll share some of this stuff, these notes to the, the Zoom chat, but I just want to give you these kind of like rather heavy thoughts, but I hope it's, it's helpful. Thanks, Paul. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Jen, and I currently work at Facebook as an education program manager. And previously, I worked at World Learning, um, and I manage a virtual exchange program, which is also through that work that I met both Paul and Sarah. And so I just really want to build off what Paul was saying today with regards to creating sustainable relationships and just offer three key lesson learned that I have from my experience running virtual exchange programs on what we can do in that space to actually foster these very authentic relationships that we hope will last. And so previously when I worked at World Learning, I managed an exchange program called the Experiment Digital, and we connected high school students from the United States and a few countries in Middle East and North Africa, including Algeria. So I'm really excited to see some people from Algeria on the call. And um, I really saw my work with the students in that space as kind of 10% of the work. So we can structure and moderate as many conversations as we want, but whether they take that and then when we remove this infrastructure and whether they continue speaking to each other is really the most important part of the work. And that's 90% of it is afterwards. And so what can I do in that 10% of the time that I have with them to get them to be more proactive um, versus more reactive? Because I can structure a lot of things and they can react to my prompts and my requirements to complete the program. But how do I transition that reaction to something that they can proactively want to do. And so here are just three quick strategies that I leveraged during my time there. And the first one is really meeting the participants where they're at. And Paul mentioned using Facebook. And um, when I was um, managing my program in the first two years, we also used Facebook. And for my participants, um, I learned the hard way um, after two years that my students from the United States high school were not on Facebook. <laughs> um, they would tell me, uh, we are not going to be able to do this because we don't have Facebook accounts and you're old and whatever. <laughs> I ignored that last comment. Um, but then I realized, OK, really got to pivot. And they were on Instagram. And so we then leveraged a photo sharing activity on Instagram and we asked them to post stories of you know, their streets, their communities, their food. And we collage that onto our program's main Instagram page where other people can see. And so that was important because one, there's just way too many accounts these days. You can't, I can't even keep track of my accounts. And then second, once you finish the program, you want them to be in a space that they're already in so that they can continue those conversations. Whereas if you remove your platform, um, how are they going to continue those relationships? So that was really important for me to meet them where they're at. The second is um, creating some space for some deeper dialogue. And I say this because um, as you create in-person relationships, how you meet friends, for me personally, I really connect with people who are able to be more vulnerable and create trust. And how do we do that in an online space? And so I also took advantage of the fact that I could create these facilitated conversations um, and do some deeper dialogue with my students. And we really scaffolded that conversation from something more generic, like what are your hopes and dreams to things that are a little bit, um, a little bit more touchy about their communities and society. And we talk about you know, who cooks in your family, what are the gender norms, what are the society's expectation of you? And through those, they can really identify some more similarities and differences in their culture. Um, but that was really important for them because it's really hard to do. But I think when done right, that trust that's built through those spaces can really fa facilitate other things that you want to do in the long term. And then third, and I don't mean to contradict myself, but you know, students all react in different ways. But the third one is um, also planting some seeds for some unstructured conversations that are more universally relatable. And so of course I did 
all the work I did to have those really facilitated dialogues, but some students were just not that into it. And I had conversations where um, students would just not respond to me. And I remember there was one group and I shared this previously with some folks on the call um, that they were just not talking. And one day I came to that platform and I got 20, 30 pings from my students. And I was curious, what are y'all talking about? And I go there and it was the summer where um, HBO had released the final season of Game of Thrones. And um, for those of you who watched it, um, it definitely generated a lot of emotions maybe not in the positive way, there was a lot of frustrations with the final season. And um, my students were all talking about it. Um, and similarly, I had some students who um, saw the lunar eclipse from one country and then they saw another. And so these things I didn't expect, but were really universal. And I think that's also kind of how I talk to people in real life. Um, you talk about things that are trending, that are happening, and maybe you just can't get that from a facilitated conversation, but you could probably plant the seed for that as you're monitoring things that are happening around the world. And so these are just three things to start. I'm sure there are many, many more from all the educators around the world, um, but I really think meeting the students where they're at and then leveraging the advantages that you have with the facilitated space um, with hopes that they can really continue to sustain these relationships in the long run. So that's all from me, and I'd love to pass it back um, to Sarah. Oh, Sarah, uh, we you are on mute, and it's probably you are on mute because I can wrap it up and pass it to you. <laughs> but I think this is great. Paul and Jennifer, thank you all so much for sharing your perspective. Definitely was over here taking notes. I love it, Jennifer. Meet them where they're at. That's the equitable approach. Paul, what wealth of knowledge you have given us. I love the piece of so many times, especially uh, in today's youth or in the collegiate environment, it's all about, let me put all these things on the resumes, but really what is impactful? What is those experiences that's transforming the world and can those opportunities of hope for impact? So thank you for reiterating those points and all the great knowledge that you gave to us in the chat. Uh, and then last but not least, I love it as well, Jennifer, plant, planting seeds. Sometimes you got to, you know, you have to, you got to will your way into the program. I get the opportunity uh, to serve as well as a, a youth exchange leader uh, for a large organization. And I quite often have to plant seeds. So I do, I do uh, understand that. But all in all, thank you all for both sharing about digital health because we do know that it's so much can be a distraction uh, with social media. And I love that how you both have been able to leverage, you know, social media and the virtual and the digital age today for good and for global impact. So thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to turn it back over to you to help us understand who's, who, who's all behind this awesome program. So Sarah, back to you. Thank you. Well, um, Everything that's been mentioned, uh, you know, Paul, one thing that I really resonate with that you said was just the um, inequity in terms of access to power. And so when we connect students and young people around the world, we really want to do it in a very meaningful way. As you say, you know, it's important to be able to initially kind of warm up the conversation with easy conversations about, well, what's your favorite food? Uh, what, tell us about your holidays. Tell us about your family. Those are safe and they can help, they allow us to build trust with each other. Um, and then slowly we begin to get into some deeper questions. For example, uh, this year in You Think, we're going to be talking about um, social justice. And so this issue of access to power is obviously central to the questions and consideration around social justice. By the way, did you know that in Algeria during the month of January, schools in January study Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think that's awesome, right? Um, and then at the end of the year, our program focuses. So we've gone through this you know, introductory phase, building trust, building comfort, building empathy then getting into some of these questions about social justice, equity, and then after you know these kind of conversations, then we begin to talk about global issues. 
and there are obvious transnational issues like climate change and migration. Um, and then there are issues uh, like the one you mentioned with corruption. I mean, it is in every place in the world. There is corruption and it's a huge power because it definitely um, influences access to power. Um, and so ultimately, I hadn't really thought about it before, but ultimately that would be a very interesting project, um, probably with university age students, at, you know, I think high school, that might be a bit much, but um, being able to talk about, well, what are, and, uh, when, I, when I talk with students about um, global issues and where we can all get involved, because ultimately it is up to all of us, every single one of us, to play an active role in making positive change. We can't just read about it. We can't just talk about it. We can't just post about it on social media. We have to make the effort in our daily lives. And, you know, with students, when I'm talking with high school students, I mean, imagine growing up as a high school age person in the world today, you know, with even before the pandemic. I mean, just the overwhelm of the issues that seem to be enormous and where in the world can we get any kind of leverage, any kind of traction. So when I do youth development training, I talk about finding your entry point. So there are enormous issues that we can all work on together. Each one of us has to find this little place just as a starting point to find out where we can make a difference, identify an issue that we feel strongly about. And one that in a sense leaves us feeling um, not powerless, but less empowered. And that's critical because that's where we can shift the balance. So when we took, take into that we're really concerned about, when we have youth together across cultures, having these conversations about climate change, you know, worried about, well, what does climate change look like where you live? And um, let's say, for example, here in the Southwest where we live, water is an issue. But then when I was talking with people in Algeria and Morocco, I discovered that was a major issue there. So youth in these different areas can then begin to work together um, after having built this trust and empathy over time and ultimately that's where this long-term connection really I see um, is essential because ultimately this generation is going to be facing enormous challenges and they have to be able to work together. There's no way that any one nation or any one group of people can solve any of these issues. We, have, we need each other. Um, and I think one other thing that Jen said in terms of meeting, meeting youth where they are, but I think that's one of the premises of building any kind of empathy is just meeting people where they are. And that includes our neighbors. That includes people at the grocery store. That includes, you know, people across the world. It, there's no uh, lack of opportunities on a daily basis for us to move our you go aside, meet people where they are, open the door to some kind of a meaningful connection. Um, so I really appreciate everything that you, Jen and Paul have said. Um, so thank you very much. So I think uh, with that, we're going to get a chance to hear from some of our other partners in a video collection. These are folks who are board members, um, supporters, volunteers, um, and again, I'll let them speak for themselves. Congratulations, Global One to One, on an incredible 15 years. Uh, Sarah, I, I remember coming back from the Peace Corps in 2006 and first discussing the idea of Peace Pal and, and what it could be and getting started with uh, Togo as, as one of the first locations. So it's been incredible to be involved in part of the organization to see all of the incredible growth um, that's happened over the past 15 years and how many uh, individuals and families this has reached. Um, so congratulations on incredible progress. 
and looking forward to uh, seeing Global One to One continue to grow and expand in the years ahead. Thanks. Hello, Chris Salmeri here, a proud past chairman of the board and board member of Global One to One. Fifteen years ago, my good friend Sarah Wilkinson had the forethought and the ability to reach out and connect people at an early age. The program began as PeacePal and has evolved into Global One to One. This is some of the most important work that I think you will find in the nonprofit sector, if not around the world. In an era where we live with technology that can connect all of us in an instantaneous manner, we still find that we have people who are just segregated by ideas, by misconceptions um, and general untruths. Global one-to-one -one reaches across those boundaries to try to smash through them to make this a better place for us all. And that is a cause worth supporting. Happy anniversary. Hello, my name is Beatriz Valencia. I'm one of the board members of Global One-to-One. -one. This amazing organization has done so much during 15 years. So let's go and celebrate together this amazing accomplishment and milestone. But that's not all. From now in ahead, we're gonna continue having a lot of other programs that are gonna allow the youth to be able to connect here in the US with other places in the world. Just organizations like you, youth like you, are just the reason why we continue working towards creating a place full of peace. Like that's what we want in the, in the globe. That only can happen if our youth is connected. And by preparing the future change makers of the world, um, we are creating venues of peace and understanding among cultures. So let's go on board and come with us with Global One to One if you want to make a difference today, you can donate, go to the website, go to the social media and make this happen. Thanks again for coming today. Continue being part of this amazing organization in one way or another. You are important for us. Have a blessed day. Hi everyone, my name is Denise Bucci and I'm part of the small but very dedicated staff team here at Global One to One. Um, I myself first got involved with the organization about seven years ago when I started off as a volunteer in the office um, and then ended up working with the organization for a couple years after that. Uh, went on to some different opportunities and continued to stay in touch and donate to them whenever I could. Um, and I've since circled back and I'm part of the team again. So I'm really excited to share this time with all of you of celebrating 15 years. Um, and this organization is very close to my heart and I just appreciate all the teachers, students, volunteers, donors, everyone who's been a part of this journey along the way. So thank you so much. Happy 15th anniversary, Global One to One. I'm Ricky Quintana with Hunard's Fair Trade. We've been partnering with Global One to One since 2013, and we've worked together on a variety of visiting delegations from Central Asia. I love that we share the same mission of unifying global communities and I'm constantly inspired by the global one-to-one -one vision of educating the next generation in this vision for the future. Have a fantastic celebration. Wow, wow, wow. Good to see Ricky, my goodness. Ricky, and I know, I think you're on here live too, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, hey, I, I'm part of my job, Sarah, is catching us back up, which is good. And I've, I've got to tell you, this is working. We just had a nice uh, $500 pledge on the Zoom link from Natasha Kolchevska. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From uh, Milashi Matthew, a $500 donation new during this event today. So folks, 500 would be great. 1,000 would be better. 100 would be wonderful. But just, just a little bit, if we all just sort of get in there, get out that phone, get out the QR code, do that. You can also just go to global1to1.org and there's a donate now button. 
that you can do. And uh, we would love to have you involved in this. Now, I, d I don't want to take up much more time because we've got Dr. Jenkins with another incredible guest and another little piece of wonderful talking that's going on. And uh, I I'm excited to hear this as we, we start to wind down everything. We're going to be going for about another half hour. So uh, stay with us. There's some really interesting things to come. Uh, Sarah, do we want to go to Dr. Jenkins now? Awesome, 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 awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for the service of all the volunteers, the board members and the mighty staff for allowing this opportunity um, every day to happen with our young leaders of today and tomorrow. So as we go to one of our final conversations today, uh, which has been really, really great hearing the different perspectives, I definitely want to have uh, Rebecca and Sarah up next uh, to really come and talk to us about you know, as we move forward. So we talked a lot today about the foundation of intercultural competency and why it matters. And then we talked about how to pivot and be flexible in the digital platform and connect it all together. But where, where are we headed? Uh, what, what is the possibility of intercultural exchanges and, and potentially the platform as we look towards the future? So Sarah and Rebecca, I have you up next uh, to share your perspective. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Rebecca, would you like to start off? And um, Haley, if you would bring up that one slide. Yes. You're still on mute, Rebecca. Yeah, sorry. So I'm very happy to be here and happy anniversary to Global One to One. I'm, um, I guess my role is partly that I was a foreign service officer with USAID, which was the international U.S. government's um, agency for international development, basically working with other countries to help them develop. And I had a very early experience of unusual in my very early youth was spent in North and West Africa. And I was, you know, saw very poor countries um, and thought that was what the world was made up of outside of the U.S. versus the Americans. And then went on the experiment in international living, which is a program which is part of world learning today, as I understand it. I went to Mexico when I was 13. And instead of finding a, and you see the picture up there on the left, instead of finding a poor country, which is what I expected, I found I stayed with a very middle class family, uh, professionals, educated. And it was a good eye opener for me to say that you know, I am just like everybody else in some parts of the world. That everybody's a bit different. Some countries are poor, some aren't, and I better pay attention to the details of that world. So since then, I've spent a fair amount of time in the U.S. working on policies and strategies and programs around economic development in, in cities, in the city of Boston, and then joined USAID. And again, spent a lot of time working on policies and strategies as part of the foreign policy world of the U.S. government. And what I've learned, I think very critically, is that those high-level strategies and policies around the U.S. interests, around global climate change, around migration policies, are based hopefully on some on data and research and best practices and knowledge from a lot of places, but essentially also from the experiences of those people who are sitting in the room making those policies. And so the kinds of experiences, the kind of people that I met, that others who were in that in those same discussions mattered a lot. Um, and the more that we had conversations, the more that I as foreign service officer, and I think you heard that from uh, Salim as well, talked to people about their reality, the more that I could be effective in my work. So that's become a very critical piece of this, is saying you know, not only is it important to build peace, but it's also really critical for people who are making decisions about the future of the world to be based in individuals, individual experience, because that's where our, our opinions often come from. And on the other hand, all those policies and strategies really won't work unless they translate down to someone's life. Um, it, it may be great to talk about climate change, but unless that means something to you. When, when um, I worked in Cambodia and you know we were talking about climate change and deforestation and emissions, uh, an effect on water and on farming, and, and sort of thought that the farmers might not be aware of what was happening to them. I went with a USDA visitor and talked with a rice farmer, and he was completely aware of what was happening to his world. It was drier, it was 
more torrential rains, it was much more difficult to grow his crops. And he knew that something was happening globally. And so it was also a good reminder that, you know, people do know an awful lot about their world and they know how these global trends are affecting them. I also uh, learned a lot by trying to work on nutrition programs because we know many parts of the world, people may eat, may have enough to eat, but not the right food. Even in the US, we know nutrition is a huge problem. Uh, so it's not, not just access to food, but it's also choice ability to purchase and the knowledge to know what, what to eat. So we were working on a program to help mothers and their babies um, to be better nourished, developed a very good recipe of local products that could be cooked and then fed to a baby and increase their nutritional status. Well, it wasn't working very well. And then we actually went and talked to some of the women and they said they don't have time. It's much too hard to put all these things to spend the time cooking, just like American women, uh, just like women around the world, it takes a lot of time. And if things were pre-processed or easier to cook, they're much more likely to be used. And so it was just one of those, duh, we should have understood that, but we thought we knew everything and hadn't thought about it. Our own experiences um, about time and how important that is to busy people who are trying to make an income as well. So we, I had a fair amount of involvement with some of the US government pro programs that support exchanges. I think you've heard about a number of them, including Global One-to-One -One and its programs now with Algeria and other places. And it, it, it was an interesting process to help identify candidates who we thought uh, might find it useful to go visit the US. And at the same time, uh, talk to Fulbright students and others who were coming into the country uh, to learn from their, from that experience as well. Um, one, one, I think very interesting example was I was in South Africa, we were working on municipal finance and there was someone in the national treasury, which was sort of like our treasury department, uh, working on how to transfer funds or to governmental finance. He wasn't very interested in the US, the history of the US government and the US in general in South Africa is pretty mixed. A lot of people didn't trust Americans, they weren't very interested. But we convinced uh, Ishmael Momoniat uh, to go take a three week trip to the US. And he came back afterwards, I think appreciating the honesty that people had shown to him, not just about the, you know, how wonderful the US is and what a great powerful country you are, but also all the problems. And I think like many of the program, programs and exchanges, people see the reality, uh, the hard things that are happening, the struggles that US, that Americans and officials are having. And he came back much more impressed with the US, I think much more trusting. He met some real people, he had made some real friendships and became much more open about having uh, a, a joint relationship in the future. He's continued to be a good friend and a friend to many Americans uh, and to build relationships across municipal finance people. So essentially, I, uh, as the world, the world is global, as we know, nothing like a global pandemic to remind us of that in the very immediate sense. These issues need to be dealt with on a very high level, but with very real experiences and a constant flow of information from the, what does it look like as an individual, fed back up into the strategies and policies and then vice versa and down. And I think the kind of programs that Global One to One does that the International Visitors Leadership Program, which is a, a keystone of the US government's exchange where visitors from around the world come to the US and, and see different cities and what's going on and has led to uh, very strong relationships. Those have been critical. And that's why US Congress continues to fund them, even in the worst of times when foreign policy, State Department have not been very popular. There has been consistent funding for these kinds of exchanges because the US government sees how critical they are in maintaining relationships positive, friendly relationships between Americans and the rest of the world. And sometimes that's not always very visible, but I think again, these one-to-one -one exchanges, actually meeting people, seeing them in their homes, seeing them in their um, environments, makes such a huge difference in maintaining that understanding between countries, ultimately, which will make the world work better. Thank you, Rebecca. I know you and I uh, had a conversation not that long ago when uh, we were just remarking on our own experience um, that in the midst of big issues, 
it always comes back to these personal relationships. Um, so you were making an example of, you know, let's say someone is uh, trying to make connections in a new field. Uh, they go back to their personal relationships and ask for introductions. Um, it's, you know, trying to get into a new area. You definitely try to leverage any kind of relationship you have. Um, I've been wanting, for example, to um, develop a program in Algeria for quite some time. And it was because Salman Haji, who participated in Global One to One many years ago uh, and was changed by his experience of studying abroad, was now at that time uh, working at the embassy in Algiers. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, what do you think of my idea? And because we had a connection, we had a relationship. He said he was interested, you know, make a proposal. And then he introduced me to Khera and Mustafa, who I are now my family in Algeria. And um, so this is just a beautiful example of how personal relationships can make the world a much smaller place. Um, you know, from the very beginning with Khera and Mustafa, you know, I think from the very first Zoom meeting we had, we felt like we were friends, you know, that we have never met each other before. We've been living on the other side of the world, but what we've been doing is, is very similar. The things that we value and our goals are very similar. And so we were able to meet at that place and then just take off from there. And, um, you know, I'm so happy that the way the different speakers uh, who've talked have really kind of woven together. I mean, certainly that was a goal uh, for, for the speakers, but it's really beautiful the way it worked out with you know, Salman talking about his own personal experience uh, with study abroad and living abroad and how now that's what he does for a living. And Robin talking about how, you know, uh, it's these intercultural skills, the ability to see each other, um, and not just tolerate each other, but actually see and hear each other are what makes the world go around. I mean, including the global economy. Um, and uh, the different layers of that kind of connection. Uh, I really loved the way Jen and Paul talked about, you know, let's, in addition to uh, appreciating the role of intercultural exchange in diplomacy and in business, Let's also take it a little deeper and start to look at how can we create ongoing, consistent, sustained uh, intercultural relationships across the globe. Certainly virtual exchange is one of the ways to do it. Um, and then Rebecca, when you're talking about you, organizations like USAID, you know, I, what I see is just the essential partnership of Policymakers, large uh, organizations like USAID, Feed the Children, and then grassroots organizations like Global One to One. I mean, and then of course the people that we're serving. So it's we need each other to be able to complete the picture and to complete the flow of information, the flow of communication, to build those relationships. So it's not only utilitarian; it's also making the world a more peaceful place. Um, Haley, could you show that slide for just a moment? Um, that was just for Rebecca's family. Um, in that photo, I um, was in India three years ago. And um, that's me with the umbrella and my good friend Rangina. And we are gazing upon the Taj Mahal. And uh, Regina and I had only met uh, through an, a virtual exchange between students in Albuquerque and students or young people in New Delhi, India. So we did a virtual exchange with these young people for several weeks. And then we had the amazing opportunity. Uh, this program was funded by the US Department of State um, and World Learning was the grantee. We became a subgrantee uh, for an actually for a reciprocal um, in-person exchange. And this is something I would really love to see more of. So imagine your study abroad, Rebecca, and uh, what if after you came home, 
uh, one of the family members came and lived with you for a while. And so then you get to see each other in your own environment. Um, that's what we got to do. You know, the we went to uh, New Delhi, went to these people's homes for two weeks. Um, Rangina and I had barely met, and yet we felt like sisters right from the beginning. Um, and, you know, it, these relationships just change us forever and they have the potential to change us forever in really positive ways. It's preferable for us to be in sustained contact. And even when we're not like Rebecca, I'm sure you can think back on people that you made deep connections with in your work. You're not necessarily in communication with them currently, but you, there's still a place in your heart where they live and they still inform the way you see the world. Um, and so I think the value of um, intercultural exchange and how, it, how we can leverage these intercultural friendships, these intercultural connections, this empathy, this realization of our common humanity. You know, as has been said several times over the last hour and a half, uh, the world is in a place especially right now, where we need each other to be able to communicate, to um, care, even just to care. Let's just start with that. Let's just start with um, caring about each other um, and then open that door of communication, which can then lead to sharing of information about holidays and families and traditions and faith. And then ultimately, given the context of the world today, um, these connections can unify communities both in and of themselves. I mean, we certainly know in the United States how divided our country feels, our national community. Um, there's certainly room for us to reach out with peoples in our, people in our own national community and begin to care about and listen to each other and then begin to tackle the real issues, which are not about uh, conspiracies, but about health and poverty and safety. Um, then addressing the larger issues. Hey, you know, it looks like the weather is changing a lot. Uh, it's, it's impacting fires and floods and people across the world. And now we're gonna be having increased migration because we'll have climate change refugees, people who can't live where they have lived for centuries, you know, as people. Uh, so we need to begin with listening, opening that door, caring, seeing our common humanity, and hopefully then using that, at least as a placeholder, to begin the harder conversations about how are we gonna work together to make this world a better place, which includes making it a safer place. Um, so uh, I, I'm just so thankful to everyone who has spoken today. Um, certainly uh, the people who have sent in their videos. Um, and we, just, we still have two more really special videos saving, maybe not the best, but um, among the best for last. We'll come back uh, and kind of recap after we get a chance to listen to these two inspiring young leaders. Hello and welcome from my classroom. My name is Evan Aguilar and I'm a music teacher with Albuquerque Public Schools. I'm also on the board of directors with Global One to One. I've been a volunteer for 11 years. I started back in the ninth grade and I can tell you Back in the ninth grade, it was incredible to learn how I could be an important member of the community in working to make the world a better place. Moving forward, as a member of the board, it is incredible to see how we're able to change lives through this organization. I wanna say a huge thank you to Sarah Wilkinson, who started this 15 years ago. I wanna say also a big thanks to the people talking today, the folks who helped organize all of this, and to you, Thank you for watching this. Thank you for supporting us. Don't forget to check out our social media pages. Don't forget to donate if you are able. And thank you a million times for making the world a better, more peaceful place.
Hello, my name is Rachel Green, and I was a student coordinator for Global One to One in my high school for three years, and a Global One to One participant for a total of seven years. In addition to writing letters to international peers, I also served as a youth ambassador for an exchange program that brought students from around Mexico to Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, called Jovenes en Acción. And Global One to One has just really provided me with so many opportunities for global awareness personal and academic growth, leadership skills, team building, and of course has provided me with so many great friendships along the way. I'm incredibly grateful for these opportunities and have personally experienced how impactful Global One to One's work can be. Happy 15th anniversary, Global One to One. Pretty spectacular, pretty spectacular. That gives us all hope, doesn't it? Uh, it's just incredible. Uh, a couple notes. Um, from the bookkeeping standpoint, which I think is pretty exciting. Uh, we've got a big thank you to Ricky Quintana for going to sake all you do and you, you pledged again today and we appreciate your $150. And Andrew Barnes just came in just during this event, which is really cool. And Callahan has pledged $100 annually, which is, which is spectacular. Uh, Deborah and Larry Blank uh, pledged $200 annually, which is great. Um, I, th I think I saw, oh, I did, uh, Greg Webb, for goodness sake, uh, just during this event, pledged $100, and uh, Ankit uh, Chabra did a $50 pledge. We so appreciate your taking the time to, to give a few dollars to make this thing really fly, and I, I'd like to wrap up my little piece of this, if I may. Um, I, I told you at the very beginning to put Put something in chat where, where you have spent some time overseas or you had made a connection overseas that really affected you. And we've all had those moments, whether it's through pen pal situations or online now or physically being there. And in the mid 90s, I think I told you this, Sarah, in the mid 90s, um, while I was at Channel 13, a um, guy named Ev Rogers, a professor of journalism and communications who wrote the book, Diffusion of Innovations, uh, called me up, took me to lunch and said, hey, they could use you over in India for a little bit. You want to go? And it was, I was working with young people and training them how to do video production. And I went and um, it, it changed my life. It changed the focus of what I did. It made me understand that there is such a bigger world out there. And in, in a small way, uh, and it was selfish. It was selfish on my part. The amount of creativity, of human capital that is around the world that is never tapped, that, that can really not only, I mean, it enhances your life if you want to look at it that way, but it enhances other people's lives. And the people that I met in India and that I still remain in contact with, and then these other countries as well, it's just it's an honor to know them and to understand and to gain a different perspective on things that has helped me in my work and my business, but also I think has helped me understand that around the world, there are so many beautiful, it's like a painter. The more colors you have, the better job you can do. That's it. If you have all these different perspectives and ideas and situations, it can make your life fuller. It can make your country's life fuller. It can make your friends and family's life fuller and hopefully other people as well. Um, something you said, Sarah, and I wanted to come back to this and I want people to think about this. What is gonna be your entry point to the world? What is your entry point to the rest of the world? Not just this community, not just your city, not just your state or your country. What is your entry point to the world? And I would suggest it might be global one-to-one -one, and we would love to have you. So um, reach out, uh, get to that website, um, really engage because I think your life will be fuller and you will change lives as well. Thank you, Sarah, for letting me be a part of this. Oh, Chris, thank you so much. And also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Jenkins. I think um, it'd be nice to hear from you before we're finishing up. Yes, no, thank you all so much. I have so many new friends on this call today and so many new friends all around the world. 
And this is why I'm so passionate about the work that you all do as Global One to One is because you allow for these moments to be lively and to be meaningful, to be impactful um, and to be transforming life changing. Um, and I believe I and I do. And I, I believe by St. Augustine, he made that quote, uh, the world is like a book and those who do not travel only read one page. And I really believe that global one to one allows for the world to read a novel. It also allows for the world and individuals to write their own story and their story that's crossing lines, cross cultural lines. So it's beautiful. It gives me hope. It gives me peace. And also it gives me understanding that the world is better because we all exist on this call today. So thank you so much for allowing for me to be a part of the space. And thank you so much for your mission and keep up the great work. You always have a friend in me. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. And thank you so much to all of our speakers today. Um, it's really been um, a great opportunity. I'd be the kind of conversation I would love to continue. Um, Shara, can, can yes. I say something just to close Please. out? Yes. Um, I, I, I do want to say this, that none of this would have been possible without Sarah. It's, it's very, very important to, to acknowledge this. Um, you will find several initiatives from Fortune 500 companies and philanthropists with, with several millions of dollars that probably talk about similar things. But it's very difficult to find a person as passionate as Sarah. And she really means every word that, that she talks about on, on this mission. Um, if all of you guys listening to this message really want every penny of your contribution to make an impact, make it to this because she is the woman who wants to make this change. So wishing this organization the, the very best. And obviously, thank you again, Sarah. Fantastic. We couldn't do it without you. And I mean that collectively. We, quit, we can't, we, we're stronger together and we need each other. And thank you so much, all of you who have contributed uh, your time and your heart and your energy today. And I know you're gonna continue to do great work every day in the world. Please stay in touch and also really please donate. Uh, that's how we keep going. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Really, really great to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Come on. <laughs> hey, <laughs> good to see you. Okay, Mustafa, thank you so much for coming. Yeah. I have to introduce you to Mustafa and Kamal, Algeria and Morocco. Good to see you all, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so pleasure. much. Great to see you. Okay. Have a good rest of your day or your evening. Bye. Bye bye.